Hello, Duke fans, and welcome to episode 418 of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. It is Sunday, April 24th, 2022. The last episode of this program that we did was called NBA Draft Decisions. Maybe we could have saved that title for today because we have a lot more to discuss. I am your host for this episode. I'm Sam Klein. I am coming to you from my parents' home in Washington, D.C., home of Donald Wine, fellow DBR podcast uh, co-host, co-producer, who I saw yesterday outside of Nats Park. Uh, as I was leaving the Nationals game and Donald was heading to the D.C. United game. So it was a fortuitous uh, meeting of the podcast host. Jason, or, uh, Jason, I'll come to you in a second. Donald, because I mentioned you first. How you doing, bud? How was the, uh, how was the United game yesterday? It was wild. Um, we have a new guy on the team. His first name is Taxi Archis. Um, he's Greek, uh, but everyone just calls him Taxi. And that man... It was a taxi show last night. He scored two goals, had an assist in his first start. Um, so it was a great, great night for DC United. So I had a lot of fun. But the highlight of the day was obviously getting the chance to spend time with my man here, Sam. Uh, we spent we, we split a beer and, and hung out for a little while. So it was good uh, to cross paths between the Washington Nets game and the DC United game. Yeah, the, the two Nationals games that I went to this weekend, uh, Friday and Saturday, they lost the first one seven to one. They lost the second one five to two. So uh, I must be a curse this year on the Nationals or what is the more likely case? The Nationals aren't very good this year. I should I should mention that I was planning on going to both games with Sam or at least one of those games. But both times was supposed to interact with the uh, Tigers game. And so yesterday I ended up watching the Tigers game from home. Obviously, is where Miguel Cabrera had his 3000 hits. So I was excited about that. Uh, but that's the only reason why I didn't join Sam at one of these losses for the Nets. Jason Evans is the only member of the DBR podcast hosting group that uh, has not had to deal with the DC Metro in recent days. So Jason Evans, lucky me, huh? at Atlanta, <laughs> in Atlanta, uh, he also let me let me spoil it very quickly. Jason Evans got to attend a very very fun basketball game last night. Is that right, sir? All right. So so wait a second. So you said you're talking about the DC Metro. You're talking about mass transit. Uh, at, at what point do I talk about the fact that I was stuck in traffic in Atlanta for an hour and a half in my car because uh, like literally not moving because there was a bomb threat. There was a suspicious package outside the Hawks game that I attended the other day. Uh, oh, my God. Uh, what a what a nightmare that was. But then what a fun, fun basketball game game it was. Um, I, I know this is the Duke basketball report. If this was the Oklahoma basketball report, we would be talking endlessly about Ice Trey, Trey Young of the Atlanta Hawks. But uh, man, it, it is he's just a fun, fun player to watch play basketball. And and you had you had good seats last night. So you were you were in the house for uh for the for the ice tray show uh and and the their toppling of the heat. So that, that was pretty yeah. cool. I, Maybe I, we... I share I share season tickets. I've had Hawks season tickets for my dad had them before me, and then I kind of inherited them from my dad. And I didn't my dad had the full season. I can't go to, to 41 games. That's a lot. That's a big commitment. So uh, I share them with a few friends and, and I went with one of my buddies. My, my seats are fifth row center court. It, they, they are really, really good seats. It's a lot of fun. So let's talk Duke basketball. We might, we might come back and, and talk Hawks for, for just a brief second, just because it's cool that Jason was there at the game the other day. But the last time the three of us spoke on the air was Thursday morning, at which point Paulo Bancaro and Mark Williams had officially declared, and we were hearing rumors that Jeremy Roach was probably going to come back, Wendell Moore was probably leaving, Trevor Keels, we weren't entirely sure what was going on, and we sort of speculated what the roster would look like, you know, with with him back next to Roach in the backcourt. So as of right now, and, and it's, it's Sunday morning just after 8 o'clock, so I feel like we need to uh, we need we need to preface that because the news appears to be coming in rapid succession these days. Uh, two days ago on Friday, or I think it was even Thursday night, Jeremy Roach uh, d- declared that he was returning to Duke for his junior season. So he's going to be back. He's going to be the, the starting point guard next year and uh, all but certain that he will be a captain. And then immediately after that, uh, uh, or actually, sorry, before that, Wendell Moore announced that he was leaving. Then Jeremy Roach announced that he was staying. Then finally, we got the news that was the one that we we were the most unsure of, which is that Trevor Keels has declared that he is leaving Duke for the NBA. 
Uh, Duke men's basketball, of course, put out uh, very cool graphics and videos for all three of them to celebrate the, the decisions that they've made and, and, and appear to be in full support of that. Haven't seen any rumors yet that, that there's any sort of consternation about any of these decisions. But guys, I guess we just need to react in, in quick succession to all three. And maybe we start with Jeremy Roach, because this is the one who's actually returning to Duke next year and the one who I'm most excited for us to get into sort of what we we expect from his junior season and what he means to the team. Jason, why don't you take this one first? I mean, this is, this is huge. The, uh, there are a lot of people who will tell you the point guard's the most important position on the floor. Uh, it's certainly considered, you know, to some extent, the coach on the floor, the, 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 the thing that drives the offense. And Jeremy Roach is, is going to be one of the best point guards in all of college basketball next year. I, I don't think there's anybody who says that's not the case. He, he'll be a contender to be a first team all ACC performer. And, and he's, a, he's a fabulous point guard. Uh, we saw it at times last year that, that he was able to take over games from that position, which is a really rare and unusual quality to have in a point guard. And, and this, is, this is a spot, D- Duke really had nothing else on the roster. I'm not going to say that we couldn't have found someone or, you know, whether it's in the portal or elsewhere. Uh, but but there, was, there was a glaring, glaring hole on this roster if Jeremy Roach had not come back. And, and I want to just really quickly talk about the, the degree to which Jeremy Roach raised his game late in last season. You know, for the, for 14 straight games from the Elon game all the way up until he was benched on February 15th, Jeremy Roach didn't score in double figures a single time for 14 consecutive games up through February 15th. He got benched. He had been the starter and then suddenly he was no longer the starter. After that, in Duke's final 15 games of the year, he scored in double figures eight of those 15 games, and he had nine points in three of the games where he didn't get to double figures. So he basically, he was one free throw away from being a double-digit scorer in 11 of our last 15 games. He had a run of seven ACC games where he was 13 of 26 from three. I'll take that. Guy going to shoot 50% from three? I'll take it. Now, look, this is certainly a guy who needs to improve his outside shot. If you look over the course of the season, he only hit 32% of his three-pointers. And I think for, for him to reach where he wants to be as a basketball player, he needs to be better than 35, maybe, maybe even close to 37, 38% from three. So he needs to work on that. But, but the degree to which, you know, there, there's one player that played for Duke for the first, you know, 20 or so games of the year. And then there's the Jeremy Roach that played the final 15 games of the year. The, the final 15 games of the year, that Jeremy Roach is an All-American contender. Start, starting with the Virginia game on February 23rd, he, he hit 60% of his two-point shots over the end of the season. A, a, dude who, a dude who is hitting 60% of his shots and driving the offense and creating opportunities the way Jeremy Roach was, yes, please sign me up for another season of that. I'm so thrilled to have this guy back for his junior year. And Donald, speaking of next season, uh, talk to me a little bit about what Jeremy Roach means on this roster. I know Jason sort of alluded to the enormous hole that would be left if he wasn't there. But as far as we know, Duke didn't seriously go after a, a true point guard in high school recruiting this year. So maybe part of the plan all along was that Roach was going to come back or at least that uh, they were going to go after an experienced transfer as opposed to finding one right out of high school. But what does he kind of mean on a roster next season that we're pretty sure is going to feature three more freshman starters, uh, which is becoming more the norm than, uh, than, than not in, uh, for John Shire's first season. Yeah, well, like Jason said, those last 10 to 15 games of the season that he played exceptionally well is why we're excited to have him back next year because that veteran experience is going to be necessary. And it's something that we, we've seen it throughout the years. Um, teams that do well in the NCAA tournament are teams that have experience in the backcourt. Uh, maybe experience, maybe you have a, a couple of captains or a leader up front or an experienced team, but it starts at the point guard, the most important position on the floor, because he's got to be the distributor. He's got to be the leader. He's got to be the guy who is even keeled. Uh, and that, that's not uh, to borrow a pun from, uh, from our keel mode friend over there. Uh, but I, I think having him in that backcourt kind of stabilizes an offense uh, in the sense that you have that guy that 
when the chips are down and things aren't going our way, he can be the on-court presence to calm everybody down and lead by example. Um, we saw that time and time again over the course of the, of the clutch time of the season, how much he was clutch down the stretch. He hit some very, very big shots for Duke um, over the last 10 to 15 games of the season, including some that were game winners or game enders. So uh, that's what I like from Jeremy Roach. That's what I've seen over the last 15 games that really gives us a super, super sense of excitement that he's coming back. Uh, but also just the the improvement that he's made over the two years that he's been here um, from where he started as a freshman to now, it's a completely different guy. And you have to imagine that when he comes back from the summer workouts, this man is going to be one of the best players in the country and, and going to come out and play that way. And Donald, you alluded to it, the confidence, the, 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 those huge shots he hit down the stretch. I mean, there, there, there were games where, Jeremy Roach made plays in the final five minutes where if he didn't make a play, Duke was going to lose the game. (laughs) I mean, it's as simple as that. And and we're talking about NCAA tournament games. Uh, Is there anyone? Hey, raise your hand if you think Duke beats Michigan State without Jeremy Roach making some huge plays in the final five minutes. I don't see any hands up. All all the hands are are down, Jason. Yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, That is... It, it's a quality you are desperate for in a point guard, a guy who has the confidence and the ability to make those plays. It's also like really hard to find. I, I mean, I know that all these guys were superstars in high school. They were among the best players in the country when they were in high school. But when they get to this level, there are plenty of guys who are like, I'm not so sure that I want to be the dude to take that moment. And Jeremy Roach showed he he wants the moment. And that's it's just huge to have that on your team. Great for him to come up with big shots in, in clutch moments on offense. But one of the other areas for development, the Jeremy Roach that we saw so much of the last couple months was his, his on-ball defense, which was something that was, you know, we sort of went back and forth throughout the season about, you know, on the perimeter between him more, maybe AJ Griffin, once he, once he sort of catches up to the speed of the college game, we were sort of arguing like who's going to be the, the, the real lockdown defender and Roach made enormous strides this year in, in being hey, able Sam, to Sam, Sam, that, yeah. that, that the game against Virginia uh, where Kihei Clark was killing us, Jeremy Roach changed that game around with his defense. Absolutely. And, 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 and amazing thing to be able to rely on because it, it's really tough when you're trying to game plan on defense, if you don't have a, a really strong defensive point guard, a guy who is able to get out on the perimeter as far out as, as you need him to be to hound the other team and sort of get them out of the rhythm in the half court. Jeremy Roach develops that ability amazingly this year. And I imagine that one of the things we'll be talking about next year when, when the season starts and Duke gets whatever big games they get early in the season, we'll be talking about how Jeremy Roach is pivotal in Duke winning those games because he's able to lock up other point guards, pretty much whoever it is uh, around the country. So that is, that is great news for Duke. And on top of that, uh, it also feels like he's going to step into a big leadership role being a junior on a team full of freshmen, uh, full of full of new young guys. We'll we'll talk a little bit about sort of general transfer portal speculation. It seems like with Keels leaving, Duke might need to go to the transfer portal for wing depth, depending on exactly how they feel about Jalen Blakes, Jaden Shute, Joey Baker. But if that's the case, lots of new faces playing minutes for the Blue Devils next year. Jeremy Roach is going to be pivotal in bringing all of that together. Let's move to Trevor Keels, who was, as I said at the top, was the player we were sort of most unsure about. Some rumors that he was leaving, some rumors that that he was going to be uh, returning to Duke. Uh, a lot of speculation during the season that he had uh, vaulted himself into into strong first round draft status, which then sort of wavered throughout the season. Injuries, returning from injuries, um, not being as much of a shot maker as he was in that in that Kentucky game to start the season. But Jason, what do you think about Trevor Keels' decision? Let's let, let's leave off the roster implications for a second, just for Trevor Keels, his decision to enter the NBA draft this summer. So I want to be clear about something. There are a lot of bad takes. There are a lot of people out there who are saying negative things about Trevor Keels' decision and and about you know how it affects Duke and the such. I, I, I like I said, bad takes. I think I think. 
I think that these these folks need to they need to think about this in a different kind of way. First of all, Trevor Keels need to do, needs to do what's best for Trevor Keels and, and for his family. And there's no question that Trevor Keels, you know, unlike DJ Stewart and, and Matthew Hurt, for that matter, Trevor Keels is going to get drafted. There, there's absolutely zero question about that, assuming he stays in, in the NBA draft. And, and he's going to get drafted in a place where he is going to get a guaranteed contract that is going to pay him millions of dollars over multiple years. No question about that. 100%. So this, this idea that Trevor Keels hurt Duke or made a bad choice, made a bad decision, I, I, I don't buy it for a second. It is the kind of money that changes lives not just your own life, but your whole family, everyone connected to you. And uh, the idea that the kids even consider turning it down is almost ludicrous. Uh, although obviously name, image, and likeness can, can help make up for some of that now. But, uh, you know, I, Sam, sorry, you, you asked not to get into this aspect of it. I've got a ton to say about this. I tell you what, I'm going to put that aside for a moment. And I'm going to start with, I want to reflect on Trevor Heal's career. Uh, you know, his, his thus far one year career at Duke, because uh, this is a guy who showed, uh, yeah, we were talking about confidence earlier, tremendous confidence and moxie, um, with, you know, with the ball in his hands, uh, the game he had against Kentucky was a, a revelation. I think for everyone that he was able to take over games like that. I mean, frankly, other than Paulo Bancaro, I don't think there's anyone else on Duke who, could take over a game this past season the way Trevor Keels could. Um, I, you know, I'm trying to think back over the course of the year. I, you know, there were guys who had hot streaks or good games, but I mean, literally that game against Kentucky, Trevor Keels took the game over. Everyone on the everyone in the stadium knew what Duke was doing on offense. They were getting the ball to Trevor Keels. They were getting the hell out of the way, and they were letting him go to the basket. And and by that, I include the entire Kentucky team. And Kentucky could do nothing to stop him. Uh, so he is, he's a, a special, special ball player with the ball in his hands. He's also, he was an outstanding defender. Sam, you were talking about defense and Trevor Keel's ability to get, he has a huge frame to get his body in the way of opposing guards and wings and make life difficult for them was, was really unique. And, and by the way, his, his NBA draft stock is primarily built around the fact that NBA teams look at him, look at his frame, look at his ability to move his feet. And they say, well, that's a guy who can defend at this level. And defending is not easy in the NBA. And the fact that Trevor Keels is going to be able to do it from day one shows you what a, a special kind of player he is. He, he had, I mean, you know, kind of an up and down year. There were, there were certainly games where he was amazing. And there were games where you were like, where's Trevor Keels? But, but you know, that's kind of expected of a, of a younger player. And, and I just thought, you know, he, he, had, he had a great year. And the only thing that was missing, I think, from him you know, literally being an all ACC player was probably just that his outside shot wasn't as consistent as we'd like. I, I want folks to, and he came into Duke with a reputation as a good outside shooter. I want folks to remember Luke Kennard because Luke Kennard was very inconsistent with his outside shot his freshman year and, and then came back and showed as a sophomore that he is a great shooter. Whether Trevor Keels is doing it in the NBA or perhaps in, at college, next year. And, and by the way, it's not impossible to imagine that he tests the NBA draft process and comes back to school. Uh, Trevor Keels, I think, is going to be way, way better from the outside, way, way better from three next year than he was this year. And again, whether that's at the pro level or the college. Coming into this season, Trevor Keels, I feel like, was the player that we knew the least because he had spent the least time as a due commitment, um, was not as not quite as hyped as, as Paulo Bancaro and, and A.J. Griffin were coming into Duke. And then when the season started, it was like, wow, Tre Trevor Keels is not just, is not just a, a important rotation player for Duke. He's a guy who's a, who's a starter who brings, as, as you said, Jason, a lot of moxie to the team. Uh, very good defender. I think has, has limitations uh, going forward as far as his decision-making with the ball. I think there were a lot of times this season where he would barrel to the basket without much of a plan. And, and I think that, uh, you know, you can rely on 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 that sort of strength and athleticism in high school and maybe a bit in college, but that will catch up with you very quickly in the NBA. So I imagine that the decision making is, is going to be a thing that he is that he's working on 
you know, during the draft process, but then heading into next season, as you said, probably in the NBA, but, but potentially back um, in college. Donald, I want to uh, come back to you. Any, any sort of further thoughts about, about Keel's season, but then I want to get into sort of what the, what the decision means for Duke. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I just want to, uh, Jason mentioned something that I think is clear to kind of note about the potential for him to come back, uh, test the waters and come back. We've seen that time and time again from players who have gone through the draft process and decided to return to school. The problem is, is that I don't think this is something that we can rely on uh, for us because our draft, our pre-draft process is so thorough that when these guys make these decisions, they make these decisions. Uh, I think there's three guys of note that I think have tested the waters while at Duke. Uh, that's Frank Jackson, Marquise Bolden, and Javin Delorier. Only Javin came back um, to Duke. The other guys ended up staying in the draft. So uh, for all intents and purposes, when Keel says he's declaring, he's gone. Um, and and that, that's a shame for us because I loved watching him play. Keel mode was, was a thing in college. Uh, it was a thing this year. Uh, and we saw it time and time again to watch him uh, just dominate uh, at times. He, he did struggle at times, but I think all these guys did. But he really changed the course of some of these games from that opening you know game against Kentucky until the very end he was a very vital part of this basketball team um in like I said I think early in the season he was our best three-point shooter and we were like wow this is if this guy's going to be our best three-point shooter then teams are in trouble because AJ hasn't come on yet like Paulo hasn't really developed a three-pointer yet Wendell Moore hasn't developed a three-pointer yet like if one of these other guys gets in the, gets a three ball then we're then other teams are in trouble and then his three pointers started to struggle. So I think there's obviously going to be something that he works on in the NBA next year. Uh, and, and really, I think teams are going to be interested in a guy who's six, five, just ch- chiseled like a, like a bull and can play physical defense and play physical offense, take his shot wherever he can, because he can push any guy on the floor. So that's going to be interesting because I think with him being in the later part of the first round, maybe early part of the second round, his uh, his stock may be a little bit set up where he can go to a team that fits more of what he is as a player, as opposed to a team drafting him at the top, which may not necessarily be the style of play, uh, but because they need someone like him, he may not want to go to that team. So uh, I think he's set up to be in a pretty decent situation. We We will see what happens uh, in the draft, but I, I'm really excited for his potential uh, and his growth and looking forward to watching him grow as a player. Donald, I'm going to push back on one thing that you mentioned about Trevor Keels. And and I want to be clear that I, I've got no sources on this. Uh, I, I don't think it's a sure thing that Trevor Keels is going to stay in the draft. Brendan Marks of The Athletic, friend of the podcast, Brendan Marks was very, very clear in his article about Trevor Keels. And, and, and by the way, there has not been, uh, there wasn't a ton of intel about what Trevor Keels was doing um, leading up to him announcing this decision. So the fact that Brendan Marks sort of has anything in terms of intel um, makes him a very valuable source. He was really clear. He said that, that Trevor Keels absolutely can come back, that he is, Trevor Keels is hoping to get a first round guarantee, you know, like a pick in the 20s. The first round goes 30 picks. And he said, Trevor's looking for a guarantee from someone picking in the 20s. And if he doesn't get that, Brendan Marks said, there's a very real chance that Trevor Keels is back in Durham. And I want to discuss for you guys a potential scenario. Think about this. You know, Trevor Keels is kind of torn because being a first round draft pick and the money that comes with it and the opportunity that comes with it you cannot turn that down. You, you, you just can't. So he thinks that's a possibility, but he doesn't know it for sure. And the only way he can get a guarantee, the only way he can know for sure that he's going to be a first rounder is to really meet with NBA teams extensively to work out for them, to have them put him through, you know, all the paces. So they go, okay, now we really know what we're getting. This is a guy that we can tell, Hey, we've got the 27th pick. We've got the 29th pick. We can tell this guy, yes, for sure. If you're on the board, we'll be taking you with that pick. He can't do that unless he goes through the NBA draft process. He's not, there are some players who are good enough that they can get a first round guarantee without going through the process necessarily. 
Trevor Keels, there's no way he can do that. So the only way that he can get this guarantee that he's been looking for is if he declares and works out for teams. But if he doesn't get the guarantee, then he can come back to Duke. And I I could, in this kind of a scenario, I could 100% see John Shire and Coach K telling Trevor, son, you should declare. You should go through the draft process. See if things work out. And and you might get a life-changing guarantee from one of these teams. And if you don't, you come back to Duke. I I think this, this scenario is very much on the table here in a way that it hasn't been for most of the guys from Duke who declared. And I'm not, again, I'm not saying it's going to happen. And it may be that Trevor goes through the process and, and even though he doesn't get a guarantee, he goes, you know what? I'm hearing enough good things from these NBA teams. I'm going to stick around. But I, I, I don't think we should rule out Trevor Keels working out for teams, going to, you know, camps and other stuff like that, and, uh, you know, that the NBA has for potential draft picks and then deciding I want to return to Duke. I think that's still on the table. I, I, I'm not saying that it's not on the table. Um, I'm just saying that previous history is all we can go off of. And previous history shows that team, that guys that declare end up staying in. So I'm not going to gas myself up by saying, oh, there's a chance he's coming back. But I'm also saying, yes, there's a scenario. But my scenario is this. The realistic opportunity, the realistic opportunity ahead of him is that he's going to the NBA draft. Until things change, things can change down the line. And I have reserved the right to be wrong. But as of right now, I am considering him in. And I don't have... Uh, reservations about him going in either. I, I think he, I think he'd be great in the NBA, and I think he's ready right now. The question is whether he's going to get one of these deals. That's that'd be great, um, but I'm not expecting him to come back. It'll be so that way. I'll be delightfully surprised when he makes this announcement a few weeks from now. Yeah, and and to be clear, I I don't think it's necessarily likely either. But but again, I, the way Brendan Marks made it sound. It was definitely a, a possibility that Duke and Trevor Keels were still pursuing the fact that he could return to school. It, it's not something that has been ruled. I think in the case of Paula Bancaro, in the case of Wendell Moore, I think it has been ruled out as a possibility that they would return to school. Uh, I don't think that is the case for Trevor Keels. I, I'm not saying that Duke should wait around for him. I think that Duke needs to be looking in the, in the transfer portal to see if they can replace Trevor Keels. And, and we can talk more about that, Sam, if you want. Uh, I've, got a, I've got some stuff on that that I think is kind of interesting. But, but I, 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 I think that there is still a chance. I don't, I'm not going to put odds on it or percentages, but there's a chance that Trevor Keels comes back to Duke. Jason, why don't we move to all of that speculation? Because uh, assuming that, that Keels is gone, Duke has a pretty big hole to fill on the wing. So the, I think the, the working assumption for next season is that Jeremy Roach is the starting point guard. Dariq Whitehead is going to be starting on the wing for Duke. He's too talented to keep on the bench. And that both Kyle Filipowski and Derek Lively are going to be starting bigs for Duke next season. Or maybe Mark Mitchell. Yeah. Or maybe Mark Mitchell. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but, but the, the big man starting positions are at least uh, – are at least locked up barring Duke finding some amazing transfer that somehow would be better than, than at least two of those incoming recruits. So uh, that, that feels, that feels pretty understood. That means that there are four starting spots uh, at four key rotation spots that are taken of those, those big men, assuming that all three of them are in the rotation uh, and, and that at least one of Jalen Blakes and Jaden shoot are able to, to fill a substantial backup role uh, on the wing, there's space for one more guy, and and it's probably a starter on the wing for Duke to replace Trevor Keels. So let's think just a little bit about one, what kind of player that might be, and two, Jason, if you've got names of of dudes who are in the transfer portal, uh, experience is going to be at a premium next season for Duke. So that's definitely a place where John Shire is going to look. Yeah. So before I get to the names, I just want to talk very quickly about the transfer portal. Um, because I've seen some, you know, I talked about bad takes. I've seen some, frankly, some idiots out there who said that because Trevor Keels waited until Saturday to make his announcement, um, that Duke missed out on some players that were in the portal. That, oh, Duke could have gone after these guys if they knew Trevor Keels was declaring. Folks, the notion that Trevor Keels declared on Saturday and that, and that it blindsided John Shire uh, it is just ludicrous. Uh, John, uh, you know, even though the players don't make their announcements to the public until whenever they want to 
John Shire and the Duke staff has known what is going on. They have known that Trevor Keels was at least strongly, strongly considering putting his name in the NBA draft for quite some time now. And just because all those all videos, those, all those videos don't make themselves, ladies and gentlemen. Exactly. Right. <laughs> the, the, the notion that, uh, you know, all of us were, were sitting here on pins and needles waiting for these announcements over the past several days. I guarantee you that John Shire wasn't waiting for these announcements. John Shire knew what was going to happen and knew how to prepare for it. So this idea that, that um, Keel screwed Duke in some way because he waited until Saturday, the day before the end of the NBA draft declaration period to make his announcement is, is just silly. I'll give you another bad take. The idea that all the best players in the travel uh, in the transfer portal are gone is, is just not true. <laughs> it's not true at all. Um, in fact, I'll give you a name that, that Duke has absolutely reached out to in recent days, A.J. Green of Northern Iowa. Now, I know when, when I say A.J. Green, there are people who are my age who probably think of the former power forward for the Los Angeles Lakers. This is, this is not that player. <laughs> in fact, uh, he, I was thinking the uh, former wide receiver for the Cincinnati Bengals. Oh, there you go. Yes, yes. Uh, in any event, this A.J. Green um, is nothing like those players. He is a a shooting guard through and through one of the best shooters that you will see um, at, at the college level guy hits close to 40% of his three pointers uh, last season. He hit 91% at the free throw line. He is the two time player of the year in his conference playing for Northern Iowa um, averaged 18, almost 19 points per game last year would uh, instantly step into any lineup, even at a power five school like Duke and be an outstanding scorer from the perimeter um, and, and would fit beautifully at Duke. Um, A.J. Green is in the portal. He just entered the portal a few days ago. He also declared for the NBA draft. He's going through the draft process. Most people think he's probably not going to get drafted. And so he's, you know, primarily in the portal. Now, there's an important thing to note about A.J. Green, which is that his father is, an, is a basketball coach. And his father was recently hired. Um, oh, God, I think it was at Iowa State. Yes, at Iowa State. Um, his father had been at Northern Iowa. And uh, about a year and a half ago, he was hired as an assistant coach at Iowa State. Now, A.J. did not transfer to play for his father last year. He could have, but he chose to stick around Northern Iowa for, his, for one more season. And uh, honestly, I think that it, Duke wouldn't have reached out to him and, and, you know, it wouldn't have been sort of a known thing that Duke was talking to him if they didn't think it was possible that this kid was not going to play for his father, that he would instead play for a different school. So uh, AJ Green is a definite possibility for Duke. And then the other thing about the portal that I wanted to mention is this. It's not closed. If, if I'm telling you that the premier program in college basketball, the, the program with the best brand in all of college basketball, a program that routinely produces high, high NBA draft picks has this thing called the brotherhood that everyone in their, everyone out there seems to, adore and want to be a part of that team needs a, a shooting guard that team needs someone to start and step in and fill it up from the perimeter for them there are a ton of guys out there who aren't in the portal yet who if they know there's a starting position at duke waiting for them they're gonna not not walk they're gonna run <laughs> they're gonna run to the transfer portal so that they can make themselves available uh, to to potentially get that spot at duke the portal is not finished. And once these NBA draft declarations are done today, Sunday, which is the last day you can declare from the draft, I think you're going to see guys, okay, now's the time to really look. Now's the time to see, do I love the situation I'm in here at whatever school I'm at? Or is it time to look at some of these schools that lost guys unexpectedly to the NBA draft and see if I can you know, really step up in terms of what I get from name, image, and likeness? you know, what I can get in terms of my brand, what I can get in terms of coaching and opportunity and name recognition, and what I can get in terms of advancing me to the next level. And Duke is the premier program in that regard. I, the portal isn't finished, folks, not even close to it. Jason, I, I think the, the key thing you brought up is that Duke is in, is in the, the best position here to leverage its own brand, to attract guys through the portal. This is not um, this is not like a, a mid-tier or low-level Division One program that's trying to to plug holes uh, with coaches you've never heard of and, and other guys on the roster you've never heard of. Um, players will will jump at the chance 
to <laughs> to to fill in that starting spot at Duke to be one of the the premier wings at at, at Duke in in John Shire's first season. So uh, I, I there are so, and there are so many more guys who are looking to transfer these days than there have been than there were even a few years ago. So yeah, Duke might have missed out on a, on a handful of of players who who could have been interested, but there will be more to come. Trevor Keels, situation is not unlike a lot of other guys uh, around the country, even as the, the NBA draft entrance date has, uh, has now passed. And, and, and I'll tell you, you know, you're alluding to, to other guys, you know, at other programs and, and looking for opportunities and such, you know, we're talking about name, image, and likeness there. And it, it's worth noting that we got a real peek behind the curtain at the name, image, and likeness process in the portal in, in just the past day, Nigel Pack of Kansas State, I, I mentioned him earlier. He was someone that if Trevor Keels was not going to come back to Duke, that I, that I hope Duke would get involved with um, an all big 12 player at Kansas State. Nigel Pack is transferring and moving on to Miami. Nigel Pack didn't announce it himself. The way his commitment to Miami was announced was there is a big Miami booster a guy who's a business, he's a lawyer and a businessman in Miami. He has pledged to commit $15 million over the course of, I think it's five years to boosting um, uh, University of Miami athletics. This booster was the guy who announced that Nigel Pack had signed a name, image, and likeness deal with Miami that will pay him $800,000 over the next two years, $400,000 a year, plus a car. This is not illegal. This is not wrong. This is how the process works these days. Nigel Pack is being paid $400,000 a year over the next two years to be probably the leading scorer for, for the Miami Hurricanes and to be an impact player in the ACC. Nigel Pack will be a preseason first team all ACC player, in my opinion, um, for Miami. And, and this entity, this guy and his company announced on Twitter that they're paying Nigel Pack $800,000 over the next two years. It's a brave new world, people. This is not the world it was in the past. And by the way, like I've said before, Duke is doing the same thing. We're just not announcing this kind of stuff. So when it comes to the portal, guys are out there looking for cash. They're looking for where am I going to get the best opportunity to build my career? Where am I going to get the best opportunity to take care of my family now, today? And if Duke has a starting spot that is wide open, that is just waiting for someone to fill it in, I guarantee you there is serious money to be made from someone and uh, you know, who's, who's willing to go in the portal and fill that spot. Uh, it, th- this is, this is reality. I mean, it's, it's uh, just to kind of clarify things. It's not the schools that are giving this money out, ladies and gentlemen, it is the, is the boosters who are saying, Hey, I will give you this NIL deal. This NIL deal comes with the expectation that you will play for, the university of insert, right? Like, so it's not that Duke is saying, Hey, we're giving you 50 grand to sign here. It's some guy, you know, hi, me, someone like someone like one of us that says, Hey, we will give you $50,000. You just have to go to Duke to get it. Like, so that's just to clarify that it is to make sure that people understand that it's not the schools that are offering this cash. That part is still not above board. It's the, it's the boosters that are doing this, but I will say this for the portal. I think you're right, Jason. There's if there's an opening spot, a starting spot, especially that makes it a more enti- more enticing to a lot of these guys to be like, "Hey, Duke, you know, right over here, pick me." Um, and Duke can have their its take of, of players. I I also wanted Nigel Pack. I'm happy he's going to Miami, but I would be much happier if he was going to Durham. But that's neither here nor there. I think when we were talking about Nigel Pack, I think we all agreed that the one guy that we wanted out of this transfer portal was Trevor Keels coming back to Duke. So um, now that we don't have that, we go to the second best option. I think AJ Green would be uh, a pretty solid pick. Um, you know, I've seen him play a little bit last year. Uh, he does have a smooth stroke from beyond the arc, and that's something that we'll need next year. Uh, a lot of, you know, just to spread defenses out to get, you know, some of these guys the basketball. But uh, I think the transfer portal is, a, is now, it, forget the name, image, and likeness part. The transfer portal is going to be a major part of our recruiting moving forward. We're going to get guys. I won't say we're going to get guys every single year that are going to start and contribute, but we're going to definitely be looking at that portal to see if there's a guy who can make an immediate impact on our team, just like Theo John did this past year. He was, I think that was a very great success story. Bates Jones as well for the role that he was designed to be. 
um, I thought was also fairly successful. But Theo John is one of the big success stories of, hey, go to a transfer portal, grab, grab a guy who can make an immediate impact and watch him do that on your team. So uh, I think because of that success story, Duke is more inclined to use it going forward because they think they can find other success stories in there. So guys, we also need to react to Wendell Moore as a, a, in addition to a couple other odds and ends, but uh, we'll take a quick break here because I think that the, the Wendell Moore news was, was a little bit more expected than the Trevor Keels news was. And we'll be back to wrap that up shortly. Stick around. So as we mentioned before the break, the one other bit of roster news, uh, known roster news that that came out in the last few days was Wendell Moore declaring that he was going to be headed to the NBA after his junior season. I know I had mentioned that that I was sort of excited at the prospect of him coming back to Duke for a senior year and all the potential accolades that could mean for him, but uh, appears that he is ready to chase his NBA dream, which which was the primary speculation uh, headed into the off season. So Jason. Uh, just quickly, thoughts on on Wendell Moore's decision to uh, to head to the NBA and what that means for him. Uh, look, I'm I'm bummed uh, the same way I'm with Trevor Keels. Uh, it, Wendell Moore is going to be drafted probably in the first round, maybe maybe early second round, but probably in the first round. He's going to get a guaranteed contract that's going to pay him millions of dollars over the course of several years and. Uh, it, <laughs> far be it from me to suggest that anyone should turn that down. I don't think I would turn it down if it was available to me. That said, I'm, I'm a little bummed because I think Wendell Moore, um, he a- had a chance to, to really have a, a special four-year career. We don't see four-year careers all that often in, in modern college basketball um, from, from players who are this good. And, uh, and it would have been really fun to have him back. But the season he had was absolutely fabulous. Uh, you know, this was a guy who I, I want folks to remember <clears throat> when he came in as a freshman, Wendell Moore shot four of 19 from three as a freshman, 21% from the three point line as a freshman. This year, as a junior, he hit 41% of his three pointers. Um, that that is a mark of a man who spent a lot of time and effort working on his game and improving at, at things that he was deficient at. You know, it, it, it's really easy to say this comes easy. And so I'm going to do the thing that comes easy. Wendell Moore looked for the thing that didn't come easy to him outside shooting. And he got better at it year after year after year. Um, and uh, he came into Duke as a great defender and he leaves Duke as a great defender. But, but his improvement this year on the offensive end of the floor was, was really special. And uh, he, he's, a, he's a beloved Dookie, you know, forever for, for all that he accomplished. Like, you know, it, it's a pity we're not going to get one more year of him. But I don't think any of us really expected that we would. And there were, there were times this year where Wendell Moore was the best player on the floor and uh, easily among the best players in, in the ACC. Um, so a, a, a great year from him, and I'm just bummed we're not going to get more of it. Donald, closing thoughts on Wendell Moore's career at Duke. There are times where you look at something or someone uh, do something great or, or have a proud accomplishment. You look on like a proud parent. This is one of those times. Wendell Moore is one of those guys that, you know, coming into Duke, way he's progressed from then till now how he's become a beloved member of the brotherhood a lot, you know, one of the most, one of the favorite amongst, you know, fans, uh, just the man did everything. He was Mr. 10, five, five this year uh, to the point where we added it as a stat in, in the stats game. Like, do you know how beloved you have to be to get your own stat line in the stats game? That is this you're up there. You're already up there, but um, no, this is, this is the, the end of a wonderful career for him. You know, again, I'm just kind of looking like a proud parent. Like my man is going off to the NBA to see off his dreams. He lived out his dream of playing college basketball for Duke and he did it exceptionally well. And I'm really going to miss having him around next year, but I'm really looking forward to seeing him blossom in the NBA. I hope he becomes one of those players that just kind of sticks around. He's not going to, he doesn't have to be a star in the NBA, but I think he can forge a long career in the NBA by being exactly who he is, Wendell Moore. And we're going to miss that around here. Yeah, I, I had 
said, I know multiple times leading up to this decision that kind of hoped that that he was going to come back, if only because I thought that a, a senior year for Wendell Moore, given all that he's accomplished so far and, and, and for the amount of progress that he's made, would be something special. But can't blame him for capitalizing on what was, you know, even even in the moments where he was not great this season, uh, huge strides that he made this year demonstrated his ability to get his body into tip top shape and and add new skills to his toolkit that are going to be super valuable in the NBA. Um, great on ball and off ball defense, uh, the ability to shoot, um, even if it was somewhat inconsistent, uh, his driving ability, his decision making, all of that was vastly improved this season for Wendell Moore. And I am I'm excited to see uh, how he progresses in the NBA. I hope that he latches on with a team that is able to continue supporting that development heading forward. So uh, a couple things, guys, that we wanted to wrap up with here. First, I know it was a was a go back on a on a topic. We had a, a little conversation about Paulo Bancaro the other day and uh, the quality of Duke one and Duns. And um, we got an email from uh, listener Michael in Gainesville that I just wanted to read uh, because because we all read it and we're sort of like, oh, yeah, 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 that's uh, that's that, that's a pretty reasonable take. Uh, Michael from Gainesville said, guys, uh, you recently talked about the best one and dones in Duke history. And I noticed you didn't mention Vernon Carey Jr. I feel like he never gets talked about despite being one of the best, both statistically and the winning impact that he had. Do you think this is because that season got canceled due to COVID? What if it hadn't? What if it hadn't? That team was good enough to win it all. Flor and FSU, both of whom projected as number one seeds. Vernon Carey was dominant. His stats on a per game basis. 17.8 17.8 points, 8.8 rebounds, 1.6 blocks. He shot 57.7% from the field and 38% from three. He did all this despite only playing 25 minutes a game. All better stats than Paulo, despite playing eight fewer minutes per game. If you mention this on an upcoming podcast, I would love the shout out. So here you are, Michael from Gainesville. You are right, sir. Uh, Vernon Carey, we did leave off the discussion. So uh, I know Jason had responded to him separately, but uh, Jason, thoughts on uh, on on Michael's email? Uh, Michael, preach on, brother. You, you are absolutely correct. Vernon Carey deserves to be in the conversation of the best one and dones in Duke history. He's he, he's not, you know, he's not alongside Zion or RJ or Marvin Bagley or Jalil Okafor, who I think are the are the four guys who to me really really stand out but yeah he's in that he's in that next group with with guys like Brandon Ingram and Paulo Bancaro I mean yeah uh, and, and there's not much you can add to what Michael said uh, 18 points per game almost nine rebounds per game a block and a half per game 38 percent from three playing 25 minutes per game I mean the numbers are kind of crazy uh so yeah uh, and and I think I think it's a pity. I think the, you know, Michael asked why, you know, is it because of COVID? Is that one reason? Why do we not talk about Vernon Carey that way? I think he's right on the one hand that, that COVID robbed that team of, of something special and that we would look back on all of them differently if, if that hadn't happened. Um, I think the other reason though, is to some extent that team was, um, was, was built around and defined by Trey Jones and the great, the great play that Trey had that year and how much fun it was to watch, you know, sophomore year, Trey Jones. So, so, you know, how, how can we be that obsessed with Vernon Carey when Trey was sort of the most beloved player on that, on that team. And then the other thing is late in the season, that team was defined by Justin Robinson coming out of nowhere to become a really, um, uh, you know, a special player for Duke. And, and so when you look back on that team, you don't look back on Vernon Carey. Maybe that's our, maybe that's all of our fault. But, uh, but, but that's just the reality of that team that we think of it as the Trey Jones team and, and the Justin Robinson emergence team. And we don't think of it as Vernon Carey's team. I, I, I guess, I guess maybe that's bad on us, but I think that's why Vernon doesn't get in that conversation about the best one and dones. The reason why he's not in that conversation that he's very underrated uh, even by us is because his time at Duke came immediately after Zion and RJ. It was, it was, that's it. It's not necessarily anything that he did is that whenever you think about the recent teams, you first go back to that Zion RJ year, which is right before he showed up. And I think that's the only reason why if if he came before them, I mean, if you think about like Marvin Bagley came before him, Zion, you know, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 
Jalil Okafor came before him. Like those guys were able to compare up until that moment. And then, yeah, COVID may have taken that season out, but we remember the season. And again, I think Trey Jones is one guy that we didn't mention. He, he wasn't a one and done guy, but he's one of the most beloved players in Duke history uh, for being there a couple of years. Justin Robinson, one of the most beloved guys we had, we've had around here in a long time. And those, that game or that season was cut short by COVID. But I think it honestly just boils back to the fact that he was the guy after the guys and, and no one remembers the guys after the guy that that's just, that's just how it happens. It's not his fault. It's not anyone's fault, uh, but he is definitely underrated. And I think those stats speak for themselves. Well, and he's not reminding us of how great he is on a daily basis in the NBA. You know, like I, um, I'm not saying anyone would forget Brandon Ingram, but, but we're reminded and Jason Tatum for that matter, we're reminded of how great those guys were at literally every other day in the NBA playoffs. Vernon Carey, just because of the nature of his game and how the NBA works and, and where his skills fit into professional basketball is, is barely clinging to an NBA roster. And so we're not constantly reminded of the player that Vernon Carey was at Duke by watching him in the NBA. So I think that also impacts things. He's still the tank. Let's be clear. That man is still the tank. Um, and we still, we still love him. But yeah, I, I think recency bias does play a role in these things. And it, not necessarily recency in, at Duke, but like you said, recency in the NBA. It's, it's literally, you know, you turn on the TV and you, you hear Jason Tatum's name and he's not playing, right? Like he may, the Celtics may not be playing that day, but you still hear his name. You still hear other guys' names. You just don't hear Vernon Carey's as much. So guys, one more bit of news that, that came out this week. Uh, not exactly the same as, as announcements about Duke playing Kentucky or Kansas, but uh, we did get a bit of a, a leak on the schedule for next season that Duke will be hosting Jacksonville University early in the year, uh, which is you know one, one name to add uh, to, the, to the schedule speculation that we will do, I'm sure, throughout the, the summer and then once it's announced in September. So, Donald, thoughts on uh, the addition of Jacksonville to Duke's early season schedule for next year? Well, I think what it is is, uh, first of all, I believe it's Jacksonville University's first trip to Durham. I think it was announced during their basketball banquet. So naturally, they're very excited about this opportunity. But uh, it does line up with, you know, some of the uh, games that we're going to see probably in the opening, you know, couple of weeks under John Shire. Maybe a couple of teams against, you know, or a couple of teams that are lower uh, Division One teams that will come in here and hopefully use as warmups for that champions class with, as I don't think we've announced it here, but has been announced already that it will not be the first game of the year this coming season. It'll be moved back to where it originally was, which was like the second week of the season. And that was more because the teams wanted, uh, didn't, didn't have the opportunity with, uh, with ex exhibition games and early season games to really mold their team to make that a, a primary marquee matchup. So, uh, I'm glad for Duke that we're going to get this, but also it's funny. Um, I was mentioning that, you know, when the three games were uh, the three years that the champions classic was the very first game of the year, Duke went undefeated. So uh, I think we like it when it's the start of the year, but I do think this will give more time for John Shire to mold his team and kind of see his lineups and tinker with them as we enter the season. So that when those marquee matchups come up, the champions classic, the PK 85, the ACC big 10 challenge, this team will be ready and he'll know exactly who he's going to go with. Yeah. Uh, so one of the things about announcing that they're playing Jacksonville is it causes you as you know, you meaning me to, to immediately go, Oh, I wonder what that team's like. And Jacksonville was pretty good last year. Um, they were one of the better teams in the Atlantic sun conference. Um, in fact, they, uh, I think they made the conference finals um, or the semifinals. Uh, they, they lost to Bellarmine um, who, who ended up winning that, that that conference um championship but uh, so the problem is like when you try and figure out what these teams are going to be next year the transfer portal has made things so crazy like i i happened to look very quickly and and there are five guys on jacksonville's team including um one of their starting um starting shooting guards starting guards who are in the transfer portal who are potentially leaving none of them have picked a new school but they're potentially leaving Jacksonville and going elsewhere and and so it's so hard to project what these teams are going to be like year to year um you know because the portal has opened things up so much but but th this will be a a fun opponent 
and perhaps not a really easy one. Um, because like I said, they, they were a pretty good team last year. Jacksonville won 21 games a year ago. So this is not Duke taking on um, a team that is not capable of, of playing at a high level. And, and uh, you know, th- this, this is the kind of club that I think it'll be very interesting to see, you know, what John Shire, you know, brings to the table for Duke in, in his very first game. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I, it. You know, has the season started yet? Can we get it there? <laughs> I also think it's funny for uh, Jacksonville's, on Jacksonville's side, like I said, they announced it at their banquet, uh, their basketball banquet. And of course, it's very exciting. Y- you mentioned the transfer portal and guys who might be considering going somewhere else. That's a nice recruiting tactic for them. They'd be like, hey, maybe st- stay because you'll get to play in Cameron next year. So uh, it goes both ways. And, and, and by the way, that game in Cameron, John Shire's first game as Duke's head coach, if you're a small school, you know, like a Jacksonville, you could not ask for a more high-profile game. John Shire's first game as head coach at Duke will be covered by ever, every major media outlet uh, anywhere. And if you're a Jacksonville player, you know, talk about a chance to put yourself on the map. All eyes will be on you. And uh, so, yeah, Donald, you're right. That's, it's, a, it's a cool inducement to bring guys to the program or keep them in the program, as, as the case may be in the portal. <laughs> So hopefully we get more uh, scheduled news leaking out over the next few weeks and we don't have to wait entirely until September when the when the full schedule drops. But guys, we are going to leave it there for day for today. Uh, it has been an impactful weekend for Duke. We're still waiting on A.J. Griffin's uh, decision, likely that he is going to be headed to the NBA. No speculation at the moment that he is going to be returning to Duke. If he does, that would be big news. So uh, regardless, we will we will discuss A.J. Griffin when he makes hey, his announcement. Sam, Sam, I'll say if, if A.J. Griffin decides to return to Duke, this will not be the only podcast we will do today. <laughs> yes, that, that, there you go. There you go. All right. So for Jason Evans, for Donald Wine, I am Sam Klein. This has been, gosh, guys, I don't even remember what episode it is. This has been 418, baby. Episode 418 of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. We will talk to you again soon. By the way, how did we how did we blow it? How did we not make it so that episode 420 happened on 420? We should have arranged that. We were very we were very close. We could have we could have been more <laughs> aggressive about this. Oh well. Should we Guys, do ep- should we do episode 420 stoned all four of, all three of us? <laughs> it would be a pretty boring episode. No. <laughs> be absolutely not. <laughs> Welcome to Dick Basketball <laughs> Report. <laughs> That's we gotta amazing. go. We're already That's on. What we we gotta about. Go. All right, guys, we gotta get out of here. That, that that was enough. I'll talk to you again soon. Duke band, take us home. <laughs> <laughs>